Good morning, happy Thursday. Um, today we're gonna read chapter seven of Stuart Little. And so go ahead and get cozy and let's go. So chapter seven is called The Sailboat Race. When the people in Central Park learned that one of the toy sailboats was being steered by a mouse in a sailor suit, they all came running. Soon the shores of the pond were so crowded that a policeman was sent from headquarters to announce that everybody would have to stop pushing, but nobody did. People in New York liked to push each other. The most excited person of all was the boy who owned the Lillian B. Warmath. He was a fat, sulky boy of 12 named Leroy. He wore a blue serge suit and a white necktie stained with orange juice. Come back here, he called to Stuart. Come back here and get on my boat. I want you to steer my boat. I will pay you $5 a week and you can have every Thursday afternoon off and a radio in your room. I thank you for your kind offer, replied Stuart, but I am happy aboard the Wasp, happier than I have ever been in my whole life. And with that, he spun the wheel over smartly and headed his schooner down towards the starting line, where Leroy was turning his boat around by poking it with a long stick ready for the start of the race. I don't know what that picture is, but I'll show it to you too. I'll be the referee, said a man in a bright green suit. Is the wasp ready? Ready, sir, sounded Stuart, touching his hat. Is the Lillian B. Warmath ready? Asked the referee. Sure, I'm ready, said Leroy. To the north end of the pond and back again, shouted the referee. On your mark, get set, Go! Go! cried the people along the shore. Go! cried the owner of the wasp. Go! yelled the policeman. And away went the two boats for the north end of the pond, while the seagulls wheeled and cried overhead, and the taxi cabs tooted and honked from 72nd Street, and the west wind, which had come halfway across America to get to Central Park, sang and whistled in the, ringing, in the rigging and blew spray across the decks, stinging Stuart's cheeks with tiny fragments of flying peanut shell tossed up from the foamy deep. This is the life for me, Stuart murmured to himself. What a ship, what a day, what a race. Before the two boats had gone many feet, however, an accident happened on shore. The people were pushing each other harder and harder in their eagerness to see the sport. And although they really didn't mean to, they pushed the policeman so hard, they pushed him right up against the concrete wall and into the pond. He hit the water in a sitting position and got wet clear up to the third button of his jacket. He was soaked. This particular policeman was not only a big, heavy man, but he had just eaten a big, heavy meal. And the wave he, he made went curling onward, cresting and billowing, upsetting all manner of small craft and causing every owner of a boat on the pond to scream with delight and consternation. When Stuart saw the great wave approaching, he jumped for the rigging, but he was too late. Towering above the wasp like a mountain, the wave came crashing and pilling along the deck, caught Stuart up, and swept him over the side and into the water, where everyone supposed he would drown. Stuart had no intention of drowning, however. He kicked his hard with his feet and thrashed hard with his tail, and in a minute or two, he climbed back aboard the schooner, cold and wet, but quite unharmed. As he took his place at the helm, he could hear people cheering for him and calling, Add a mouse, Stuart! Add a mouse! So there's the wave, and then there's him climbing back. He looked over at he looked over and saw that the wave had capsized Lillian B. Warmath, but that she had righted herself and was sailing on her co course close by, and she stayed close alongside till both boats reached the north end of the pond. Here, Stuart put the wasp about, and Leroy turned Lillian with his stick, and away the two boats went to the finish line. The race isn't over yet, thought Stuart. The first warning he had that there was trouble ahead came when he glanced into the wasp's cabin and observed that the barometer had fallen sharply. That could only mean one thing at sea, dirty weather. Suddenly a dark cloud swept across the sun, blotting it out and leaving the earth in shadow. Stuart shivered in his wet clothes. He turned up his sailor blouse closer to his neck, and when he spied the wasp's owner among the crowd on the shore, he waved his hat and called out, Dirty weather ahead, sir. 
Wind backing into the southwest, seas confused, glass falling. Never mind the weather, cried the owner. Watch out for flotsam, dead ahead. Stuart peered ahead into the gathering storm, but saw nothing except gray waves and white crests. The world seemed cold and ominous. Stuart glanced behind him. There came the sloop, boiling along fast, rolling a bow wave and gaining steadily. Look out, Stuart, look out where you're going. Stuart strained his eyes and suddenly, dead ahead, right in the path of the wasp, he saw an enormous paper bag looming up on the surface of the pond. And there's the two ships racing. The bag was empty and riding high, its open and gaping and wide like the mouth of a cave. Stuart spun the wheel over, but it was too late. The wasp dove her bow spirit straight into the bag, and with a fearful whoosh, the schooner slowed down and came up into the wind with all sails flapping. Just at this moment, Stuart heard a splintering crash, saw the bow of the lily plow through his rigging, and felt the whole ship tremble from stem to stern with the force of the collision. A collision, shouted the crowd on the shore. In a jiffy, the two boats were in a terrible tangle. Little boys on the shore screamed and danced up and down. Meanwhile, the paper bag sprang a leak and began to fill. The wasp couldn't move because of the bag. The Lillian B. Warmath couldn't move because of her nose stuck in the wasp. Waving his arm, Stuart ran forward and fired off his gun. Then he heard above the other voices on the shore, the voice of the owner of the wasps yelling direction and telling him what to do. Stuart, Stuart, down jib, down staysail. Stuart jumped for the halyards and the jib and the forestay came rippling down. Cut away all paper bags, roared the owner. Stuart whipped out his pocket knife and slashed away bravely at the soggy bag until he had the deck cleared. There's Stuart tacking the bags. Now, back to your foresail and give her a full, screamed the owner of the wasp. Stuart grabbed the foresail boom and pulled with all his might. Slowly the schooner paid off and began to gather headway. And as she headed over to the breeze, she rolled her rail out from under Lillian's nose, shook herself free, and stood away to the south hard. A loud cheer went up from the bank. Stuart sprang to the wheel and answered it. Then he looked back, and to his great joy, he perceived that the Lillian had gone off in a wild direction and was yawning all over the pond. Straight and true sailed the wasp, with Stuart at the helm. After she had crossed the finish line, Stuart brought her alongside the wall and was taken ashore and highly praised for his fine seamanship and daring. The owner was delighted and said it was the happiest day of his life. He announced himself to Stuart and said that in private life he was Dr. Paul Carey, a surgeon dentist. He said model boats were his hobby and that he would be delighted to have Stuart take command of his vessel at any time. Everybody shook hands with Stuart. Everybody, that is, except the policeman, who was too wet and too mad to shake hands with the mouse. When Stuart got home that night, his brother George asked, asked him where he had been all day. Oh, just wandering around town, replied Stuart. And that's the end of chapter seven. So I think we're gonna stop there for today and we'll do chapter eight on Friday. So yeah, I just hope that you have a wonderful day class and I'll post tomorrow.